Good morning, everyone. We'll begin just a moment early so we can start our week as we always do with the Pledge of Allegiance. If you would please stand. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Time sure flies by sometimes. As we reflect back at certain moments of our life, certain special moments that stick out in our brain, there are big ones, you know, there's graduations, there's accomplishments, maybe promotions, but also things like a wedding day. And it's hard to imagine, it's already been 16 and a half years since I had the amazing privilege and honor of marrying this beautiful person right here. You know, some people, as they're preparing for their wedding, they get a nickname of Bridezilla. Have you heard of this before? Where the person preparing for the wedding becomes so overbearing and so anxious and so frustrated by everything that they're like a monster. I will gladly report that was not the case for Mrs. Hebner. I don't know if I've ever seen someone so happy and joyous preparing for the big wedding day. You just mention the word wedding to her back then and she would oh, bounce around everywhere with this kind of excited pep in her step and every bit of the detail preparing for that big day was just an amazing fun adventure. And that day itself was so much fun to wait for that and day by day have the time pass and you get more and more excited. The day is coming, the day is coming and then finally it's that wedding day and it's a very surreal moment, I'll tell you students, as you think towards your future to see your beautiful bride walking down the aisle and to look at each other face to face as you're being married knowing like this is it, this is what we've been waiting for, how exciting and then to know that there's celebration to follow with all your friends and family. We were so blessed to have over 300 people join us at a reception that was so much fun to follow. I love this picture. It was at the reception. Uh, if you know us kind of well, then you know this picture describes the two of us perfectly uh, because the wedding photographer was going to take a picture and so there I am. I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. I'm focusing. I'm paying attention. And there's Mrs. Heaven who's like, ah, my wedding! Very much how the two of us are. You know, every culture has its own way to celebrate weddings. Every culture around the continent right now has their own different kinds of celebrations. But even going back in time to the time of the people of Israel, they had their own cultural celebrations. Everyone's kind of the same, right? You have the bride and groom coming together. There's the ceremony and then there's some kind of celebration to follow. Well, in the times of Jesus, they had that same ceremony and celebration, but there was much more to it than what we have maybe one wedding day. For example, they would have people who would be waiting for the party, maybe on the day or the day before, and as they were waiting, then the groom would finally come with all of his friends and maybe the groom's men in like this big parade, kind of think of like a big festival, and the, and the groom is coming and he arrives, and then when he arrives, then everyone joins together in one final procession, one final grand parade to the wedding, and then they're married, and then Oh, the celebration follows, but, but not just a few hours of dinner and dancing like we have. Their celebrations would take days, maybe even an entire week. Maybe you know that story of Jesus w with the turning water into wine. Maybe that helps you understand why that was such a big deal and an embarrassment for the couple. They're not running out of wine for an hour or two. They might have run out of wine for like the entire week. That, that was a big deal. And so, wow, the celebrations, so big and so joyous in those days. And, and Jesus, knowing that, takes that cultural context of a wedding and applies it to a very important illustration and story for us to consider today. And so let's take a look at Matthew chapter 25 where Jesus takes this cultural custom and embellishes it a little bit for us to understand a very important point. Jesus says, at that time, the end times, when he will return, at that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins 
who took their lamps and they went out to meet the bridegroom. So they're going to wait for this big procession of the groom to come and then the celebration. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps but did not take any oil with them. The wise ones, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. I suppose we can make maybe a little parallel to the candles that we have here. I don't know if you know, these are actually fake. They're, they're filled with oil. They have a burn time of a couple hours, so maybe every three or four weeks I have to refill them with oil before chapel. So think of oil running out in that kind of a way. But verse 5, the groom, the bridegroom, was a long time in coming, and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. They all knew the celebration was going to happen. They all knew that the groom was going to come. They all were tired because it had taken a long time, but not everyone was ready or prepared. Well, at midnight, the cry rang out, Here's the bridegroom. Come out to meet him. So the groom is coming. He's a ways away yet, but he's on his way at that moment. It's time. Then all the virgins woke up. And they trimmed their lamps. So think maybe of like a big torch with like cloth wrapped around it and you trim off the charred edges and you add more oil to it. The foolish ones said to the wise, give us some of your oil. Our lamps are going to go out. Here they are unprepared. They're not ready to go to the celebration. They're not ready for the big parade and then the celebration, the feast that follows. But the wise ones said, no. There may not be enough for both us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. And so they go off and scramble to find some oil. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready and wise went in with him to the wedding banquet and the door was shut. And so the five and five separate. The foolish ones who weren't ready, they're left behind. The other ones are going off to this great wedding feast and banquet. Well, finally, the end of the story, later, the foolish ones came and said, Lord, Lord, open the door for us. But he replied, truly, I tell you, I don't know you. You weren't ready. You weren't prepared. You're not part of this celebration anymore. And now here's finally the point that Jesus makes. Therefore, keep watch because you do not know the day or the hour. You know, with a regular wedding, it's easy to prepare because you know the date. They send out save-the-date cards way in advance, maybe a year or eight or nine months in advance. Save the date. This is the day coming. And then later there's an invitation. You know when the day is coming specifically. Ever wonder why Jesus doesn't tell you specifically the day he's coming back? How do you think you would act or behave or what do you think you would do if, if you knew that Jesus was coming back on February 1st, 2024? What temptations might you fall into to maybe get a little lazy with your faith or, or to think, you know what, I can do this or I can do that because it doesn't really matter. I can get serious through all of January 2024 and then I'll be ready. Instead, with us not knowing when the groom, Jesus, will return on the last day, it forces us to be ready, to be prepared, to keep watch because we don't know when he's going to return. And so I'll ask you this question. Do you think you're one of the wise five? Or do you think you're one of the foolish five? Do you think that you're ready and prepared or could it be perhaps that some things are causing you not only to fall asleep spiritually but also to be unprepared for the Lord to return? What things in your life cause you to be foolish at times? Could it be that we get so caught up in what we're doing and in the work and the busyness and the schedules and the meetings that we kind of lose track and lose focus on what really matters? 
Could it be that you're so focused on your future and maybe for the faculty and the teachers you're thinking about your kids growing up and raising them and all the programs they're in and then maybe retirement at some point. Maybe for students you're so focused on scholarships and college and what career you're going to be and, and all this stuff in the future that we all lose track of the future that really matters. The future that lasts forever. Or could it be that we've been waiting so long here we are waiting for this grand procession for the Lord to return, the groom to return and this wedding feast and man, it's been about 2,000 years now and we've become a little lazy and a little apathetic that maybe other things are more important that rest on my pillow on Sunday is more important than rest in the pew on Sunday. That finding satisfaction in Among Us or Call of Duty or binging on YouTube or Netflix, that that brings more instant satisfaction than, than reading some book called the Bible. That maybe living your moment and your life right now brings you greater joy than unending joy that is yet to come. God forgive us for all the times that we become like these foolish virgins in the story and, and are maybe caught a little unprepared spiritually. And God be praised that for all the joy of our wedding days, and, and I was very blessed to have quite a beautiful wife dressed so beautifully on that day with a dress that she treasures, that she still has, that she still takes out every year on her anniversary. God be praised that you and I are dressed even more beautifully than that. That our groom loves us so much that he would come here before the wedding first to live and die for us. That he would wash us clean and as it says in Ephesians 5, that we would be presented to him as a bride without any stain or blemish. Completely pure, like a bride wearing a white wedding dress, we are dressed in the robes of his own righteousness. God be praised that he gives to us by his grace this amazing feast that is yet to come. And so I want you to think for a moment, what can you do in your life to bring your attention and focus to that great feast that is yet to come? For that day that either the Lord calls you home or the Lord himself returns and you're at this great marriage banquet, what is more important than that? What is more joyous than having a seat there? What lasts longer than eternity? Can you make some adjustments on how you focus in your religion class or even in chapel? Can you make some priority shifts in your worship life for Sunday? Can you make some time adjustments to dive into the word to see what your loving groom wants to say to you? Because we do not know. We do not know the day that he will return. And I was reminded of that again this last week of how short our time of grace is with a very personal story. So this person here on the screen is Liz Johnson. Liz is a 2004 graduate of Wisconsin Lutheran High School. Her brother and her sister graduated from here as well. Those of you who are St. Jacoby people on our campus might recognize the name. Her mother was a teacher for a very long time at St. Jacoby. After Liz graduated from Wisco, she went to UWGB and was interested as a very adventurous person in things like theater and such. She was a flight attendant for a while, but but the Lord was tugging on her heartstrings to serve in a very special way as a teacher herself. And so she transferred over and finished her degree at Martin Luther College, MLC, and became a teacher. And she taught for three years in Texas. And we crossed paths then as she took a call and taught for a number of years at our school in Florida. And so we became very close friends with Liz, always a a dedicated servant. If you had to put her in one category or the other, she was definitely one of those wise people waiting for the Lord to return, so serious about her faith, so loving of her Savior and other people. Well, about five years ago then, we took the call to come up here to Wisco and move back to Wisconsin, but we still kept in touch. And sure enough, two years later, she also took a call and came up to Oconomowoc where she was teaching at St. Matthew's Lutheran. And it was a joy to be able to see someone that you know every now and then. Mrs. Cousins also very, very close with Liz Johnson. But you never know 
when it's time for the marriage feast of the Lord. And so this last year, as all this COVID business is starting, Liz, in about April or so, is finding that she's not feeling so great, and so she goes to the hospital to see, and they find, oh, you have a mass in your ovaries. And then they find in a day or two of tests that it's cancer. But Liz, the, the wise person, the wise Christian, approaches it with tenacity and fierceness and, and trust in the Lord. So she does the treatments and does the, the chemotherapy, but trusts in God and his will all along the, the way. And yet as time progressed into the summer, they found the cancer is not regressing. In fact, it spreads to your spine. And as time progressed further, then the word came about two weeks ago, there's no turning back now. The end is near. And so it was eight days ago, last Saturday, that I drove with Mrs. Cousins and with my wife to go see our dear friend and fellow Wisco graduate for the very last time. And it was a very surreal thing to talk with her mother in, in the parking lot, but to talk about the, the sadness and at the same time the joy of the marriage feast, she kept saying, her mother kept saying over and over, that that joy tempers our sadness. And so one of our teacher friends from Florida went in to speak with her for a few minutes and then Mrs. Hebner had her 20 minutes and then Mrs. Cousins had her 20 minutes and then I went last to speak with her. And some of you know what that's like to see someone who is just a shadow of the person that they once were and to think about this is probably the last time that we'll get to talk. And so on that day I, I read these words to Liz from Psalm 84. How lovely is your dwelling place, Lord Almighty. My soul yearns, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. A psalm not only about God's house where we worship, but God's eternal house in heaven. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those whose walk is blameless. And as tears streamed down her eyes and mine too, she expressed such great trust and hope in this joy of heaven that is waiting for her. And two days ago on Saturday morning, she went to that marriage feast of the Lamb in heaven. Times like this can be filled with so much sadness, but maybe think of it in this perspective. If, if you had a billion dollars and I asked you for $20, do you think you might maybe give me $20? Now, if you had $20 and I asked for $20, that would be a lot, right? That's asking for everything. But in perspective of a billion dollars, $20 is nothing. That's chump change. So can we think of it maybe this way? How sad it is when we lose someone in this world. Maybe for 20 years or 30 years, we lose out some time, we lose out on some memories. But in a perspective of a marriage feast that lasts a billion years and way beyond an eternal marriage feast, no joy can possibly be compared to the time that either God calls us home or our Savior himself comes to meet us face to face. God be with us and God bless us each day as we wait with eager joy for the groom to return or to call us home, to take us to that marriage feast and God help us to be ready and prepared for the celebration that has no end. Amen. Let's join together in prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we come together in prayer today on behalf of one of our Wisco family, the Johnson family, and we ask that you give them an extra measure of your comfort and peace as they mourn the loss of their family member and a friend to many, Liz Johnson. Temper our tears of sadness with tears of joy, knowing that Liz is now with you at the marriage feast of the Lamb. And Lord, make us ready and prepared each day for that day that you call us home or come back to take us to be with you so that we can all join at the marriage feast that has no end. We pray for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Today we'll close 
by singing a hymn, which is one of the great hymns of all time that is a retelling of the story that you just heard, this parable of the wise virgins. Let's join to sing Wake, Awake. Our soloists will sing the first stanza. You're invited to join in singing stanzas two and three as we close today. Wake, awake, for night is flying. The watchmen on the heights are crying. Awake, Jerusalem, arise. Midnight hears the welcome. of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. God bless your day.